Hello! Welcome to Buzzing with Cousin, Cousin Talk. I'm your host, Cousin Johnny. How's everybody doing today? And by the way, Happy New Year. Goodbye 220. It's over. It's gone. Hasta la vista. 10-4, good buddy. Elvis left the building. Okay, this is the first show of the year. And uh, and let's start the show off with, with great vibes and a great historical event. In June, 16 through 18, in June, 1967, we had here in Monterey one of the biggest historical events, an event that changed well, influenced rock and roll history, the Monterey Pop Festival. So I've got two special guests now, two photographers that shot Monterey Pop right here in Monterey. And let me, I'm excited to introduce these guests. Let me introduce Fred Arellano and Tom O'Neill. Here we go. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Happy New Year. Well, welcome, gentlemen, to the show. This is going to be great. And I'm uh, so happy and, uh, and uh, proud that you guys are here because I don't know if you're a, you know, an elementary school student or a, an old timer like me. We've got an obsession with the Monterey Pop Festival, and <laughs> we're glad you guys are here to share this with us. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys questions, and then if you guys want to uh, add to uh, the other person's answers or whatever, go ahead and uh, feel free. We're three friends here or three cousins here having a good time. So uh, let's start. Uh, Tom? How did you, how did it happen? I mean, were you a photographer? You got an opportunity or how did you end up doing it? Photography, it was, yeah, well, at that time, photography was very, very new to me. And uh, in a kind of in a nutshell, you know, it's uh, just a, some serendipity that happened. Uh, timing was very important and uh, and again, you know, like in so many cases, you know, being at the right place and I was very lucky and at the right time, but you know, there were some things that where I relied on friends from the past and, and I was able to meet Lou Adler and John Phillips, um, simply by hanging out in front of the Monterey police department when I knew they were coming there for a meeting and I, I approached him and, um, you know, he brought me in, I gave him a photograph of the mamas and papas that, uh, that Guy Webster had taken, and, but I had done kind of a psychedelic effect to it, and he really liked it. So he told me to stick around. I went into this meeting with him and, and Michelle and John, and um, actually Johnny Rivers was there too, and they met with Minnie Coyle and, and the chief of police, and it got a little heated. Anyway, uh, the, when the pop festival happened, I, I had also uh, – run into a friend of mine that, that knew David Crosby's manager. And she said, if you get any pictures of David Crosby, I'll make sure that his manager sees them. And so when the festival was over, I gave my pictures to her. She sent them down to LA. I get a phone call to come to LA and the rest is history. So it's, it, well, I should it, but there was a little bit more, but it was just truly a, a remarkable event. Over 50 years later, Fred and I still have vivid memories. Well, I'm I'm just uh, like I was saying earlier. It was just it's an obsession with this Monterey pop that it was so fantastic. The music, just the vibes, and it just it it's going to live forever. And uh, so, Fred, how was your story? How did it happen? Well, um, what would you think? It's, uh, it, it's kind of similar. It's a case of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I was. Um, fascinated with photography uh, in grade school. And then when I 
went to Monterey High, uh, I took a, ph a photography course from um, Lou Parasini, who was my teacher. And uh, about a month or so before the pop festival, uh, we found out that there was gonna be this huge festival in Monterey and they were looking for volunteers. Um, and by, you know, back then we didn't know what volunteers mean, we don't get paid pretty much. So anyway, uh, to make a long story uh, unbearable, we uh, we went out to the to the festival grounds, and I got a, a bag of film, and uh, I had my mom's camera, and uh, I got turned loose. Now I walked into the production office at three o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, and to introduce myself and say, "Okay, here I am. What do you want me to do?" And this guy comes up to me, and says, uh, "Do you live in Monterey?" I said, "Yeah." you know where the airport is? Do I know where the airport is? Yeah, didn't you fly in last night? He goes, no, my name's Jan Wenner. I just started a magazine in San Francisco called Rolling Stone. I wow. drove down from the city last night uh, and I got to pick up John Phillips and Lou Adler. Do you know where the airport is? I said, yeah, it's about a mile down the road. So we jump in the limo and we drive out to the airport. And uh, back in those days, you could drive right out onto the tarmac. So we drive out there and here comes this Learjet. Now I've never even seen a Learjet before. Yeah. And the thing lands, it, come, it taxis right up about 20 feet away from the limo. The door opens and um, Phillips and Adler get out and Jan Wenner is standing there to greet them. And I'm there with my camera and I got this very iconic picture of them uh, doing that. Um, I, I'll show you the picture in just a second. But anyway, that was the beginning of the Monterey Pop Festival for me. And then later I found out that uh, if you look at the tail of the Learjet, there was no number on it. And yeah. uh, that federal number, every plane has to have it. Well, then I found out this was the first jet that William Lear built and uh, it was a prototype and uh, he loaned it to them for the weekend. Wow, great. Yeah, so, so that, <laughs> and, great. Yeah, and then, uh, that was the beginning of the pop festival for me. So friends, and, so, uh, and here just you remember, I, I graduated from high school like two days earlier. So here you thought you were gonna go to the festival and move a couple of chairs and then you ended up. <laughs> you yeah. Know, you know, yeah. yeah. And uh, the funny thing was, um, one of the greatest photographers of our time was is Henry Diltz. So yeah. Henry Diltz, Tom O'Neill, and myself spent the entire weekend shooting, literally shoulder to shoulder, and yet we didn't know each other. We all met after the festival. Uh, Tom was working for uh, a doctor in Monterey, <clears throat> taking before and after pictures, was a plastic surgeon, and I applied for a job there, and that's how we met. I was just thinking that, um, you know, like, you know, this uh, interview that we're doing, and, you know, I'm calling you, and you're calling me, then I'm calling Tom, Tom's calling me, and then, and, uh, you know, like a week, a couple of weeks before I called you guys. and But anyway, what I'm saying is these guys had no cell phones, no laptops. You got guys flying in from England. You got guys flying to the monitor, you know, at the airport. You get their book in like probably two, three hundred rooms. They're, they're getting food for the green room or whatever that back room was called. <laughs> and, and they did it. And, you know, it's just with the with uh, no technology and here we have technology and we're we're still like hey what how or you what you know what johnny that's a very astute point that you just brought up because uh you're absolutely right they had <clears throat> no cell phones no computers uh no uh instagram Maximum. all they had was western union and the telephone they put the entire festival together in six weeks wow that's great yeah
And that, as Tom can tell you, Tom's got an interesting story about the guy who actually was the brains behind the Monterey Pop Festival. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, yeah, I mean, really, it was the um, it was kind of the brainchild of of uh, Lou Adler and John Phillips. And uh, as as Fred mentioned, uh, it was put together in such a short period of time. And six or seven weeks before, they were actually having dinner at, at Cass Elliott's house with Paul McCartney. So okay. there were Cass, John Phillips, Lou Adler, and Michelle. And prior to this, John and, and Lou had been thinking how there had to be some way that they could make uh, the music more credible and, and more uh, accepted by in the general, you know, general public. Because at that time, uh, rock and roll was really, really looked down on. It was trishy, and, and a lot of people were so against it. They wouldn't even tolerate it for, all, for, for anything. So they wanted to validate their music uh, as an art form. Kind of like that. So they actually took the model of the Monterey Jazz Festival. Okay, yeah. Three-day event, same place. I mean, literally the exact same model and duplicated it. They just changed the name. And and it worked. And, you know, and, and Lou uh, asked all the top music critics to come. Ralph Gleason was one of them. And, and Ralph Gleason had started out as a jazz critic and was not that big on rock and roll in the early days. And he became one of the biggest advocates of it. Yeah, and Joel Sullivan. Yeah, and, and so he got these incredible people to write about it. He did get as many photographers as he could. Oh my God. To get the, the pictures out there. It was very, very clever and they made a film about it. And all that was very successful. But uh, in terms of food and the green room and all that, um, it was the first time where the producers of any kind of event, and this was the first three-day rock and roll music event in history. Yes. Yeah. Monterey was the template. That it was, was the template. Yeah. Even Coachella today, uh, you know, it's you know goes way back and exactly. had its roots uh, in Monterey Pop. So, but what Lou wanted to do is he wanted to make two things very different for the performers. Because normally when these guys would perform at venues, even like the Fillmore Auditorium, or they were more in the back, backstage, back rooms. They were more like dives. And the food was terrible. There was usually burnt pizza, yeah, right up stuff, you know, Coca-Cola cans. It, it was terrible. And the sound system was never that great. They used to be four monitors. Yeah. So he gave, uh, he provided a state-of-the-art sound system. David Crosby even said on stage when he came out, he said, finally, a decent sound system. Wow, great. And, yeah. and he provided a 24-hour kitchen with a chef that prepared uh, steak and lobster, 24 hours. Oh, wow. yeah. And so they had the best food. I mean, you were hungry? <laughs> Guess what we got? You want to be yeah, good? Right. Wow. So, and he, he provided seating, which had never been done like this before. So, you know, he went all out and he knew that if he could make the crowd comfortable, they the crowd's energy would go back to the the musicians on stage. And if the musicians were comfortable, they weren't starving. They had they knew they sounded good. That made them actually play better, more as a unit. Oh, put yeah. More heart into it. And so it just went back and forth. And that's why so many of the of the performances were just the best ever. Well, Tom, and, and, and you know, Tom, you're absolutely right because I've worked on both sides of the microphone. And I'll tell you this: yeah. uh, where after you've driven for a couple of hundred miles and you're tired, yeah. you're cranky, you're hungry, you walk into the venue and they say, "Okay, here's your dressing room. You want to take a shower? Yeah. There's a shower. Here's uh, a fresh, fresh towel." And as soon as you get out of the shower. We got a great dinner, and you can see the artists just kind of go, oh, thank oh, you. Wow, yeah. And, and then you have, because believe me, I've done shows with artists that had to go on because they were late. They had no dinner. They had they didn't even have a chance to get cleaned up. It was get off the bus, put the guitar on, and entertain uh, 20,000 people. 
And you know, if you haven't eaten all day, how you get cranky and say, you don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want to see anybody. And Tom brought up the best point of all. If you make the artist comfortable. That's it, yeah. That's It's like throwing a pebble into a, a pond. It just yeah. radiates out and the crowd, and it, it, it's a symbiotic relationship feeds off of each yeah. other. You know, there, there's another little right. fun tidbit that um, not everybody hears. Uh, and I, I, we all, both Fred and I got this from Lou Adler, uh, who, you know, co-produced it. But uh, originally, the, you know, there were signs all over the fairgrounds that said, by entering this property, you agree to be televised. You, you agree to be, you know, video. Your image. We can use your image. Because this was going to be an ABC movie special. Right. So that's what the original intent of the movie was. And ABC had put up the money for it. They had put up a huge amount. Uh, 500 to get grand, it. I think it was. Uh, it, was, it was quite a bit. It was sizable. So they That's did sizable. the movie, and they got the best ever in terms of documentary films, uh, the genius um, D.A. Pennybacker, and he even created and, and, um, or, and built, specially built these 16-millimeter uh, movie cameras that you could put on your shoulder. You know, yeah. we all took for granted with video cameras and doing all this. Well, then everything was on tripods. They called them sticks. So it, it really changed the look of, of doing an event. Well, here these guys are walking around and being able to crouch down on stage with these cameras and, and get a lot more candid, a lot more, you know, right into it. It was just remarkable, the footage they got, uh, plus a, a, a brand new prototype sound system that uh, to, to sync the sound into the movie camera wow. that Kenny Backer had come up with. Another Because he was part engineer and part cinematographer, brilliant guy. And anyway, so when the film later on after the festival, it took quite a bit of while to look at all the footage. He came back to Lou Adler and he said, guess what? This is a film. This is a movie. This yeah. has to be in the theaters. Yeah, so what they, what they did then is uh, when ABC television said, well, can you show us what you got? So uh, Pennebaker said, sure. So what he did is he only showed them the, you know, like Jimi Hendrix humping his guitar and, and the Who smashing their gear. And oh, this yeah, and yeah. ABC television went, whoa, we can't put this on TV. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, guys, but we can't use this. So yeah, but, went, yes. I was just going to say almost that. Yeah, it, it's exactly, but I got to say, because I, 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 I once Lou said this, I never forgot it, but it's almost verbatim. And I have to add that the the CEO or the president of ABC was this staunch, conservative, uh, Texas Christian. <laughs> <laughs> he had very strong Christian values. Praise praise to him. Fine. That's fine. Yeah. He has his right. But when he saw these this video footage or this movie footage of Jimi Hendrix virtually having sex with this Marshall Lamb, yeah. he stopped the machine. He pulled out pulled everything out, he handed it to Lou Adler, and he says, not on my network. Oh, yeah. Take this and keep it. And by the way, keep the money, too. So they walked out. They now had the rights to the oh, yeah. Okay, the yeah, yeah. Plus, they got to keep all the front money, which I don't know exactly what it was, but it was sizable. So it was a win-win. And, and it was wow. a much better idea on, on D.A. Pennybacker's part to realize that it was a film because that way it went all over the world. And when you exactly. think about it, you can, exactly. you can ask anybody, you know, and even younger people as well. I mean, people that yeah. certainly weren't even alive at that time. Do you have, do you have anything in mind? Do you have anything in your mind or any imagery of Jimi Hendrix burning his guitar on stage? And most of them will say, yeah, because they had seen the film. There were only right. seven, thousand people in the arena that's it yeah. Yeah. millions and millions of people have seen this historic moment where he burned oh, his yeah. heart. i was about 15 points away so from many what's uh yeah we and every time i talk to you guys i there's something else that comes up you know it's like you know when you watch a classic movie and it's like 
you watch it and you pick up something else. Hey, I didn't see that last time. But every time I talk to you guys, like, you know, at an event or somewhere, I'll ask you a question because I got an obsession with this Monterey Pop. And you guys say something that's like, really? You know, you know another I, thing really was, there. I didn't know they were when there. They were, when they were putting this whole thing together, they're going, well, how in the world are we going to pay all of these people? And so they had a brilliant idea. This is why don't we turn this into a benefit? for young students. That way we can get sponsors. Uh, we can get free advertising because it comes under a public service announcement. And so the only person that I think got paid was Ravi Shankar, right, Tom? Yeah, they paid wow. him five grand uh, because uh, Ravi's manager had made a deal before uh, with ABC that he would get paid and then they then they turned it into uh, a benefit. And since uh, this happened before the fact, then that's the only person that really got paid. But everybody else got uh, first class travel. They got first class uh, lodging. So they were like queen for a day, so to speak. You yeah, know? yeah. They, like Fred's right, they created a foundation. Um, and that way, you know, people were, where uh, they and they probably even took a tax write off for making a contribution that so everybody won, um, but the um, the other thing that that again not too many people know about is that um, the, the guy that really was instrumental in kind of putting the seed in the ground um, was a guy by the name of Alan Parisier and he yes. knew I mean he was kind of, he was from the same area he didn't know personally these guys too much. But uh, in fact, I don't think he knew them at all. Um, but he had gone to the jazz festival in uh, 1966, and he was so impressed about it. He says, yeah. "You know, I I can do this, and I know a guy that does events, nothing like on this scale, but does more jazz events." So he got together with that guy, and he was and Alan Prezier was able to borrow, I think, ten thousand dollars from his mother. As, as, as I said, he lived in Beverly Hills. Yeah. And, and he was able to put down a deposit to hold the three days yeah. in the following year. Oh, my God. Oh, and it was just like you know. your lucky got the 16th. So, 17th, 18th. so he, he starts working with this guy. Uh, his name will come to me in a minute, uh, who later dropped out. And they come up and they say, well, we've got, we'll get, we got Ravi Shankar. Terrific. You know, he got booked. You know what? We need a contemporary act to really, really be the lead, to, to be the headliners. Let's see. How about uh, Mamas and Papas? Good. I know how to get in touch with them. So Alan Parisier gets in touch with Lou and John and tells them about this, that he's got these three dates, you know, reserved at the Monterey Fairgrounds, which is the home of the Jazz Festival. Yeah. And he wanted to book them. So they just immediately almost said, you know, we've been waiting for somebody like you. And all of a sudden, there was this joining. And eventually, um, uh, John and Lou bought Alan out. But Alan stayed on as, Alan Preacher stayed on as a producer. But he was instrumental. So that he deserves to get some of the credit. He yeah, he does. And uh, the moms and the papas were red hot at the time. Yeah, they were. And, uh, and this was kind of towards the end of their the rain, so to speak, yeah. because they broke up uh, not long after the pop festival. Yeah. Uh, but they they were instrumental uh, and that their name brought a lot, a lot of people in and yeah. then people started going, wait a minute, what the hell's going on in Monterey? Uh, and they said to the manager, go find out. And then pretty soon they got inundated and and the way that that Hendrix got into the pop festival, do you want to tell that story or you want me to? You go ahead. Okay, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. Chas Chandler, who was the original bass player in the Animals, big tall guy, okay, okay. he decided he didn't want to do this anymore. He wanted to get more into production, okay? So he's in New York City uh, at the Peppermint Lounge and he sees this guy playing with Wilson Pickett's band, right? Uh, and it was Hendrix. And uh, he came up to him at the end of the show and he goes, man, 
uh, you got it going and you don't belong in this band. I want to take you to England and introduce you to some of my friends. And Hendrix goes, well, I don't have any money. He goes, don't worry about that. Can you be ready to go in two days? So he flies Hendrix into London and wow. Cream, Cream was playing in this club. And so he walks in there with Jimmy and he asks Clapton, can he sit in with Cream? Nobody oh, man, that's great. And, and Clapton looks at this guy and goes, well, who the fuck is this? He goes, trust me, this yeah. guy is gonna blow your shit away. At, oops, sorry. <laughs> and uh, he says, well, he said, please don't make me regret this, okay? Really? So Hendrix gets up and he plugs in and he starts playing Killing Floor. And he's about halfway through the song and I, and he said, Clapton was just looking at this guy and finally he, Clapton stopped playing, he put his guitar down, he walked back to the table with, and Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck were sitting at this table and Clapton sat back down and said, uh, oh, we're in deep shit. <laughs> and Paul McCartney was there and Paul was on the board of directors of the Monterey Pop Festival. He gets on the phone to um, John Phillips and says, uh, I, want, I want you guys to book this guy, Hendrix. Uh, right. And uh, uh, Phillips says, we're not gonna book him because he doesn't have a record deal. Nobody knows who the hell he is. Uh, and yeah. he's, based, he's based in London. So, you know, as we all know, Jimmy's from Seattle, but at that time he was at a flat and everything in London. And McCartney said, okay, I'm gonna make this real simple for you. You either book him in the festival or uh, I'm leaving, okay? So they said, hey, if you feel that strongly about right, we'll it. Give, we'll give him a shot, what the hell, the yeah. Kid stays in the picture. So uh, Hendrix literally walked on stage a rumor and he left a legend. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. I will tell you this, okay? Uh, every once in a while, you have these watershed moments in your life where all the cosmic, uh, all the cosmic tumblers come together. Yeah. When Jimmy burned his guitar up, I was standing there and I said to myself, "Self, this is it, man. This is what I want to do. I want to be part of this." And Tom was was right there as well, and that was a turning point in our lives. I mean, uh, I've never been. <laughs> quite the same uh, yeah. since then. And yeah. you know, uh, Jimmy just, uh, he was beyond belief. I mean, you know, that yeah. was unbelievable. The first, but, uh, Sunday night, Buffalo, Springs, Buffalo Springfield, Jimi Hendrix, The Who, and the Mamas and the Papas closed the show, but The Who and Jimi Hendrix, my God. You know. And, and Otis Redding. Just yeah, and no, 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 no dancers running around, no, yeah. uh, no flash pots, no nothing. It was just about the music. So Hendrix, did they, uh, they put together the band Mitch Mitchell, No Reading? Did they? They didn't play long. They, yeah, that was, and I'll tell you another funny story, and this is uh, very short. Uh, Stephen Stills and Jimi Hendrix were very good pals, and they had a a very soulful connection. Okay. Yeah. And about uh, a month before the pop festival, uh, Hendrix's manager called up Stephen Stills because uh, Hendrix wanted Stephen to play bass in his band because Stephen is one hell of a bass player. And not many people know this, but he's no, very good. Yeah. And so Hendrix's, uh, Stills' manager took the call. And he said, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll have Stephen get right back to you on this. And he never told him because he knew that if Stephen would have taken that call, yeah. he would have been on the next plane to London and that would have been the end of, Bu of Buffalo Springfield. Wow, so, yeah. So then uh, Mitch Mitchell came along and Noel Redding came along and that was the Jimi Hendrix experience when Stephen found out, oh my God. He was furious. Uh, needless to say, his manager was immediately fired, you know, and uh, he said, well, I didn't, and Stephen says, why don't you let me make my own goddamn decisions? Well, there yeah. I go again. Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> you know, there's, there's another thing, um, you know, that Fred was talking about a few moments ago with Jimmy being on stage. 
um, you know, we were both there just 15, 10, 15 feet from, uh, I think Fred was actually even closer. And uh, I've talked to other photographers and some of them have said, one in particular who was right next to me, uh, Jill Gibson, who eventually got a picture of him and it was on one of the other cover shots of Rolling Stone. But she told me, she said, you almost couldn't take a picture. You almost couldn't put your camera up to your eye because the experience would be uh, diluted. Oh, yeah. uh, as soon as you put the ca that viewfinder and cover one of your eyes with this camera body, yeah. you know, the, the whole experience is, is diffused quite a bit, the impact of it. Hendrix was so powerful when he came out and he started playing Killing Floor and just with this strong, without the bass and drums yet, he comes in and just, you know, like a crazy locomotive tornado just yeah. coming right off the stage. And then when the bass and drums kicked in, the stage exploded. Oh, yeah. And exactly. Exactly. And then he had that upside down. He played the guitar upside down. Yeah. And, and, and people were standing there with their jaws open. I remember Steve Miller standing right next to me with his jaw open and he said people are not supposed to play guitar like that yeah <laughs> yeah you know? no. and uh i i had just i was just at that point i was just learning how to play the guitar you know and i'm looking at hendrix and here he is playing it upside down and backwards and he never bothered to change the strings either he yeah. just turned it over and and you know uh it was probably the most outrageous thing I had ever seen in my life. Uh, and um, Well, yeah, it goes beyond. And then when he, he finishes, um, yeah. and he had and actually talked about when he goes up to the amps and does all these hip gyrations and getting all this feedback, you know, and being able to control it. Yeah, exactly. And, Tom, and, that, and, and then back, you can't control it. He slides the guitar, kind of throws it, and it just lands perfectly at the foot of the stage. And then he kind of just slides into it on his knees, pulls out a can of Ronson lighter fluid. Oh, yeah. And sprinkles it just a little bit, then takes a little book of matches, strikes it. One match. That's oh, all. Yeah. The Drop it. Boom. I know. When I've tried to light my own barbecue, and I'll go through a whole <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. You know, pour and more stuff on, and nothing right. blows up my face. You know, it, everything was <laughs> was so seamless and and like choreographed. He had never practiced it or anything like that. And he, it was. Then he leans back on his knees. You've seen the pictures. Ed Kareff's iconic shot of him, almost. You know. Um, Pain, you know, like, it, yeah, like you know, as the worship and you know, sacrificing his his god, his music to the gods of music, and and it, and it was just, it was just amazing. Uh, and then he picks it up, and he goes a complete reversal in terms of the energy and spirit, and then goes into this rage, this psychotic rage, and starts hurling it around the neck of the guitar. It's it's being held together by some of the strings. Right. I, I saw mic stands and all that. And the roadies are sitting there grabbing these thousand dollar Newman mics and everything and trying to pull them off and, and protect them. And he goes mad on stage. So he goes, he went from this beautiful, beautiful spiritual moment to where he's expressing so much rage and, and then takes the rest of the guitar and throws it out into the audience and storms off. And, and some people, you know, we're we're actually in shock, and and like some people, oh, just about everybody was in shock. Yeah, and, and so how do you photograph that? When yeah. you, I mean, people are ducking and things like yeah. that. It, it, and it was absolutely extraordinary. I regret that I didn't have my my camera up there. Like there were there were guys doing it. Well, like, and you know, and it was, like you said, you would have had to put your lens up. You were so in awe that you just said, I'm just going to watch this event. I'm going to watch When Jimmy, when Jimmy started uh, 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 burning his guitar up, I was standing off to the back, back side of the stage, and there was Lou Adler, Steve Miller, and then the fire marshal. Okay, He sees what's going on on stage. So he runs to the back and grabs this fire extinguisher, oh, no. and he yeah. starts running towards the stage. Now, Lou Adler's a big guy. He's like 6'2", okay? Yeah. 
And at that time, he was still a robust young man. He grabs the fire marshal by the back of his coat yes. and pulls him back and said, what the hell is wrong with you? He's going to burn the stage down. No, he's not. Yeah. Now, bear in mind that the Monterey uh, Fairgrounds at Arena, it is a very large, dry, wooden box. And it was built in 1937. Okay. okay, that's what the fire marshal was afraid of because if there would have been a fire started, they would have never been able to stop it. Yeah, okay? they would have stopped it. Anyway, yeah. uh, he grabs the fire marshal and pulls him back and says, If you go out there right now, I guarantee you are going to start a riot. Okay, leave it alone. And, and while he's talking, Hendrix is going through all of this. And then somebody, one of the roadies, came up and threw a packing blanket over the top of the stage where it was still smoldering and they poured some water on it and it was done. But everyone was just going, you know, in the audience. I mean, I, I saw people out there just, what did we just see? You yeah. know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was it. No, it was just, uh, and and uh, Ed Karef, who's a friend of ours, uh, Yeah. And, uh, and I talked to him frequently. Um, he he told me that he was able to get a chair, and probably the, the best thing, as as important as a camera, for Hendrix was to get one of the audience chairs, which were a typical folding metal chair. Yeah. So he was able to get on that, and that gave him another twenty two inches elevation. And when Jimmy came down on his knees, Jimmy came down. Ed was able to stand up, and that almost equalized the camera angle. There were other people that had different angles, but it wasn't as strong. But so Ed, did a nostril shot. But but Ed and Ed didn't know who Jimi Hendrix was. Um, but prior to to that, when the Who was on, he said this guy, one of the photographers next to him with an English accent, said, "Save your film for the next guy. Don't yeah. you know this no. way." That's all he heard. So he kept watching his film. He did have one role left. And and that shot, he was going through it. And at the end, nobody knew this was going to happen. The famous shot that he got that is so iconic was the last frame at the end of the role. And most, most Kodak film and all that, 35 millimeter rolls, they take 36 exposure. This was on the 37th exposure. And the, the frame was actually complete. Usually you only got half a frame. But in this moment, another another serendipitous moment for musical history, he exactly. got the whole, whole frame. He didn't know what he had. Wow. He didn't know. All he remembers was the heat was yeah. so intense because he was, you know, literally two or three feet from. He had yeah. to lean back and almost fall off the chair getting that shot. Oh, wow. And, that, that and is he black and white. It was colorized. It was colorized years later uh, by Rolling Stone. That's later. But the yeah. story goes on. So here's this young photographer. He was still in high school. Goes back, Southern California, processes his film, finds out that uh, and, and makes some prints. Finds out that Jimi Hendrix is playing at the Whiskey on Sunset Boulevard down in L.A. So he this is great, great where we're all. So he goes down to that part of L.A starts working the strip where all the motels were. And it was a lot, the strip at that time, it was a lot different than it is now. Anyway, yeah. he keeps going into these different motels, asking, he said, is, is Jimi Hendrix around here? Is he staying here? No, no. Finally, he comes in. Yes, he's staying here. He's out by the pool, if you want to see him. So yeah. with his photos, walks out. Here's Jimmy and his Speedos, two beautiful women on either yeah. side, of him, and his agent. And and so uh, it's nice. This young kid says, "Jimmy, hi. I, I was at Monterey Pop. I, I got some pictures. Would you like to see them? Sure. One of the nicest guys ever. Yeah, uh, he was. Yeah. And and so uh, Ed shows him these shots. He goes crazy. Oh, Jimmy goes crazy over him. Yeah. And the one that is so iconic, um, he says, "You know what?" And he says to his manager, "He says this is so great. Here, I'm going to sign this." So Jimmy signs the back of the print. All, all, all releases all rights reserved, all rights for publication or anything. He essentially gives gives uh, completely all the rights to Ed as this young guy 
uh, Ed's in his, uh, I think he's early seventies now. Yeah. <laughs> and he is, he's very careful, you know, who gets this, this picture, but he owns completely the, the rights by an artist giving it to him. Nobody's ever done that since. And his yeah. agent was and said, yeah, you got to do this. Then they became friends for, for quite a while. And uh, Ed went, even was at Woodstock photographing him. But wherever he played, Ed could go wow. back. Oh, wow, That's man. Of it. That's great. But right. again, serendipity, right place, right time. Right place, um, right time. And that, that's basically where it's at, you know. And yeah. when, the Who, when the Who checked in uh, on Sunday to play, they, the Fender uh, Musical Instrument Company furnished all of the amplifiers and some of the instruments that were used at Monterey Pop. And they had uh, what they call a Fender Dual Showman at the time that was the biggest amplifier Fender made. And the Who, the Who said, sorry, we're not playing through those because we use Vox uh, exclusively. The only Vox dealer in Monterey County was Gadsby's Music. Now they happen to have three uh, Super Beetle amplifiers and these were huge. And uh, in 1967 money, they cost about 900 bucks, which today would be closer to like 3000. Okay, so we called Gatsby's, they delivered the three amps and they said, be very careful with these because yeah. these are the only ones on the West Coast right now. I said, no problem, okay. So the Who go through their thing, and of course, they completely destroy all three yeah. of the amplifiers. Right. So the guy comes from the music store to pick him up, and he comes to the stage store and he goes, yeah, I'm from Gatsby's Music. Oh yeah, we remember you from yesterday. Yeah, where are my amps? Yeah. And all of us just looked at each other and we all just pointed uh, to the center of the stage and he walks out there and it's just this smoking pile of rubble. Oh, yeah. His eyes get about this big, and he goes, "My manager is going to kill me." And he yeah. starts hyperventilating, and uh, the Who's road manager comes over and he goes, "Oh my God, we seem to have a bit of problem here." Hundred dollar oh. amplifiers, and he pulls out the biggest wad of hundred dollar bills I yeah. had ever seen. Well, I was seventeen. What the hell did I know? Yeah. So he's going, "How much were the amplifiers?" Uh, 900 a piece, okay, is this enough? He keeps, here you go, and he takes $200 and he stuffs them in his pocket and he goes, and that's for your trouble, mate. Have a good day. <laughs> your trouble, mate, yeah. He goes, that's for your trouble, mate. And uh, we're all just kind of standing there, you know. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Now, Fred, uh, uh well, I had a conversation with you before out on in the town. You were saying about the stage, there were that burnt mark on the stage that is on the on the stage of the uh, fairgrounds. That's yeah. not the real burnt no, mark. You see, somebody, I don't know who it was, but about 20, 25 years ago, somebody put some scorch marks on the stage. Dude, this is where Jimmy burned his guitar up. Yeah. That's total bullshit because where he actually did it, was in the middle of the stage, right up front. Now that stage, if you look at it, uh, it's concave like this, okay? Yeah. Because it's a horse arena, so it's an oval. So what they did is they built in the shape of a trapezoid, for all of you people who didn't fail math in school, uh, they built the trapezoid out, uh, and that's where Hendrix burned his guitar up. And, uh, that that's where the scorch marks were. Now, for all of you trivia people out there, the people who, the guy who built that that uh, extension to the stage was none other than Harrison Ford. Wow, wow. Because, because at that time, at that time, he was a, a carpenter in Southern California and he was building sets for the movie studios and which was, you know, good money. And uh, about a week before the pop, the 50th anniversary of the pop festival uh, happened, Tom and I were at uh, a function uh, hosted by the Monterey uh, Museum of Art. And Lou Adler was there. And this question came up was, was Harrison Ford really at Monterey? 
And Lou Adler says, well, I can put that question to rest because I hired him. Yeah, okay. Remember? Wow. And uh, yeah. so, but again, nobody again, nobody knew who he was. Yeah. You know. I want to ask you guys a question. Was that a on uh, Eric Burton's song Monterey? He says, even the cops grooved with us. Did you have any interaction with the police? Uh, I did a little bit, you know. They were, uh, they were friendly. Yeah, I did some work for the Monterey Herald, you know, while I was still in high school. So I I met a few of the, the police, but you got to understand both sides of this too, okay? Because uh, when the Monterey Pop Festival began, Vietnam was raging. A lot of kids were getting drafted and they didn't know if they were going to uh, be alive in two weeks. Uh, and Monterey was this uh, release valve for everybody. And the police had no idea. They said, well, we got all of these hippies that are coming into town. They're going to be fornicating in the streets. Uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of problems. That entire weekend, they had two arrests for drunken disorderly. Not one wow, person got busted for, for any kind of drugs. And there was this guy, I can't, Tom, uh, I can't remember his last name, but he set up a teepee for people that are having bad acid trips. And that was the first time any of that had ever, you know, and, they, and, yeah. and he came in and lay down he and he had a couple of nice girls in there. They would say, everything's going to be all right. You're just stoned. Just relax, yeah. you know. And yeah. I mean, just walking around those fairgrounds, it was like being in a Mardi Gras, uh, a snake oil show, uh, and a three ring circus all wow. rolled into one. And well, you know, and and uh, to add to the, what Lou was talking about, the culture at the time, you know, the, the influx of this subculture, the hip, you know, the love generation, the lip, the the hippie movement, and all that. Um, you know, that had a lot of people freaked out and they were very confused about it. And one of them was the mayor of Monterey, Minnie Coyle. Oh my God. <laughs> she equated the, the hippie with the Hells Angels. She thought they were one and the same. Yeah. So, you know, when there was all this publicity about the hate, um, you know, in San Francisco, the hate Ashbury and, and with the popularity of John Phillips, you know, a, a song that he wrote, um, you know, uh, and the mamas and papas made famous, but uh, when you go to San Francisco, don't forget to wear a flower in your hair. And it turned out that that brought <laughs> hundreds of thousands of young kids, mostly girls, to wear a flower. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. You know, on Hate Street. But so they thought that this this subculture that was just, you know, blowing up like this was going to come. And this Armageddon would be happening, like, and as Fred said, with sex in the streets and protesting and breaking windows and, you know, total disruption, total disruption. And so her paranoia just ran crazy. And then, of course, the police chief at the time, you know, he picked up on that. So to quell her, he says, oh, we'll have everybody in riot gear. So that's why the police are there with with uh, riot helmets on. Yeah, and, and by Saturday afternoon, he sent half of them home. Yeah, and Elaine Mays, who was one of the other photographers there. Yes, uh, Elaine. Ter terrific photographer. And she was also at the at the one, um, you know, 50 years later, she was one of the seven with us. But anyway, she took a shot of a helmeted police officer making a daisy chain out of yes. a chain out of daisies. And, and that kind of sums it up about what the police had to do. And it's, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. There was yeah, and I remember by when Saturday afternoon, uh, one of the cops says, uh, man, I have seen more action at PTA meetings. Oh, yeah. Know? And yeah. he said that half of me was standing around going, hey, boss, can I take the rest of the day off? Yeah, you know, they, they had nothing happening, you know, uh, and uh, they said that the kids were, were were very well behaved. Nobody was uh, out of out of line. But see, also the cops were not as educated as they are today yeah. about about drugs. You know, about being able to spot things. But uh, at that point, you know, people in Monterey were just starting to get high. You know, 
And this is before cocaine uh, came around and speed and all these other things. And it was basically some psychedelics, mushrooms, uh, and, and a little pot, you know. Uh, and boy, uh, I tell you, just in, as soon as the media found out about it, you know, and they started sending tour buses through Haight-Ashbury, that was the end of it, the end yeah. of the summer of love. That because the hippies were, what are all these tour buses all of a sudden? Well, because we were on Time, the cover of Time magazine last week. That would be the end of it, yeah. You got something you want to show us, Tom? Yeah, I'm going to show you. I'm going to try and show a picture right here. I mean. I it, Margolin, the actor from the Rock. Oh, yeah. right yeah. in the middle. That's great. Uh, there's Richard Perry right there. Uh, but it just gives you an idea of what the crowd was like and, and uh, you show the disruption. And wow. you know, another thing was they they had never done anything like this. So I mean, there was no there was no protocol. There was no nothing to base what they were going to do because most of these kids had never gone to a jazz festival or anything like that. So you know, basically, you got in your seat and then you, you stood there. And then that was the first day. Now, by the third day, <laughs> you got people really <laughs> having fun, and the air, you know, and when when uh, Let's see. There you go. Wow. Uh, there. When Janice came on, oh boy, that's somebody we haven't mentioned yet. But that oh, was, wow. <laughs> yeah. That was that was wow. just that was groundbreaking. The crowd, uh, what a, I can't the they masterminded this genius to have geniuses to have a a a, a soul. Uh, performers, uh, jazz performers, rock and roll performers, folk performers, and a and a a man playing sitar. I mean, come on! I mean, how does that variety of music? Yeah, no, no, he, that he was. Wanted, he wanted again the the <clears throat> the endeavor was to to validate pop popular music, pop music, and that was you know the music of the time, rock and roll. But he was trying to make it this music at the time and, and of this subculture inclusive, you know, of somebody like Robbie Shine, you know, with the sitar music. Uh, yeah. look, look what the Beatles, look what George Harrison did with it a little bit later on. But um, and and certainly jazz and blues and give it this this uh, legitimate tag that it was it was credible. I have talked to more people. That, that were about 12, 13, 14 at the time, um, young girls, young boys, or teenage boys, and some had just uh, uh, not listened to their, their parents and somehow snuck out of their room that night and gone and, and saw some of the, of the festival. But for the most part, they all had these regrets that their parents wouldn't let them go because the music was so terrible. Yeah. So you know, that was really the thing. So rather than just to have a bunch of acts out of San Francisco or even bring, since Lou and John were from L.A., just bring in some L.A. bands. No, he wanted to give it this whole wide melange and mixture and include all this kind of music that was treated and looked at, you know, as more as art, as artistic. Art, yeah. Right. This, no. this type of stuff. And, and it was very, very successful on that part. So um, people forget about that. And now another thing we have pointed out that's, that's also uh, fun to bring up is that um, he got people from San Francisco. He had the Grateful Dead. He had Quicksilver Messenger Service. Uh, he had the Jefferson Airplane. Uh, and he had, you know, the, the L.A. bands, uh, the biggest being, you know, you had the Birds and then you had the Buffalo Springfield. Yeah. Yeah. So what he did essentially is he uh, and and Henry Diltz talks about this all the time. I've actually got his metaphor from it. But he, but Lou and and John brought these two tribes together, and exactly. John, and you know San Francisco that music was more organic. Yeah, you know, much more organic. The oh, LA music was I'll more electric. Oh, you so know, weird. much more electric, psychedelic. David Crosby was was basically the first a musician with a folk band, and all the bands at that time first were were folk bands, 
um, he was the first one to get his band to go electric. And a lot of that, had, a little bit of that had been influenced by Bob Dylan. But then once the birds went electric, then everybody started going that way. So yeah. um, anyway, <laughs> there was an obvious difference between the, the Southern California bands, the LA bands, and the San Francisco bands. And quite honestly, they didn't like each other. And yeah. the Grateful Dead, Jerry Garcia, Grateful Dead, they didn't want to have anything to do with the LA bands. And what happened was they all met and they became friends and they're friends to this time. Jerry Garcia and David Crosby became very good friends. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and, and, and Crosby, Stills, and Nash, they all moved up to the Bay Area. Yeah, and then Jerry Garcia ended up playing uh, pedal steel on Teach Your Children. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, it, it, it had, there were so many benefits that, you know, kind of go unlooked. The only it, band that really yeah. didn't fit in was the association because yeah. they were a very slick, they were a great band, but they had this very slick image. They're all dressed in suits and ties. Oh, and, yeah. and they represented the, the corporate end of this. The car, uh, then, uh, then along came Mary, right? Is that yeah. what Yeah. yeah. And Wendy, uh, never my love. Anyway, I wanted to show you guys this photograph here. I don't know if you can see it. I can see it. This is um, Lou Adler and John left. Phillips getting out of the uh, Learjet. And there yeah. is Ron Wenner greeting them. And wow. that was the iconic shot I took at the Monterey Airport. Uh, and I was using a four by five speed graphics, uh, a press wow, camera. That's, Fred, that that's thing a, that's was a very classic. hard to hold. And then this wow, shot. That's a classic. Yeah, uh, here's the uh, Paul Simon. I got that just as he was coming off the stage. And then, uh, which way am I moving this? Then the birds. Yeah. Uh, that was with David Crosby, Roger McGuinn, and uh, Chris Hillman. Um, this is a book that uh, our very good friend, Dana Arvig, who is the head of advertising at the Monterey Herald, she put this uh, book together. And it is, um, it's called 50 Years of Monterey Pop. Okay, yeah, that's and a good, basically, that's good. Uh, Tom and myself, and there's, there's Tom and- Oh, that's uh, great, that's great. There's the both of us. I'm going on eBay, tonight I'm going on eBay. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll make sure you get one, here's mine. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely now, that, Tom has got that book, uh, and he's got another one uh, called Deja Vu All Over Again. Tom, is that a book about how he actually created that iconic shot right there. Wow. So, Tom, you did the the cover for Deja Vu, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash. Wow, that's <laughs> – where was that taken? Wow, that's beautiful. That was great. Uh, that was taken in uh, – um, just before Woodstock. It was taken in 1969. Yeah. And um, and released in um, I, I think it was released actually in 1970. Yeah, that's but, great, uh, Tom. That is that's fantastic. I've got some other. Uh, there's a shot of Crosby right there. Uh, some of the outtakes yeah. from that session, and um, they uh, there's one in here. Uh, this one right here was actually. Uh, going to be the cover shot. Um, and David Crosby, as you can see up in a tree, his eyes were too obscure. So, uh, David Geffen, their uh, one the actor, yeah. uh, said, you, you got to find another picture. So they came up with the one that's that uh, they took on the cover now. So, and, um, yeah. you know, uh, Tom also shot the very, very iconic show that Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and Joni Mitchell did at the Esalon Hot Springs in Big Sur. Oh, oh wow. That, is <laughs> that was on September 27th, 1969. Wow. Was that right after Woodstock I'm, or right before Woodstock? I'm so honored to have you guys here today. Well, you can have a you guys anytime have, you want. I, I, you got two more hours? We can go two more hours. 
I'll get the wine out. No. Well, Johnny, why don't we do this again sometime? Yeah, Maybe we can do it again. You can, have, well, you can have some of your viewers write in some questions. Yeah, maybe that I think that's what we'll do. And uh, maybe in a, a couple months, if you guys are, well, we'll do everything from just viewer questions, just ask. Uh, anybody, anybody, you know, and then we could work something out where uh, we could give away a couple of uh, signed books. Wow, that, yeah, that'd be great. Now, you know, and and Tom and I would be, in, would be very honored to do that after this whole virus thing gets by and we all yeah. get vaccinated, maybe we can give another talk somewhere and, you know. I know. Uh, I, I've, been looking, a couple of books. I've been looking forward to that. Now, uh, I'll, I'll, now they, I'll ask you a couple more questions. Uh, I don't want to keep you guys too much longer, but uh, that was a nice tribute that they, they had the 50th anniversary. I know it wasn't quite the same. But at least no, they, they, they honored you guys. They honored the photographers. Lou Adler really? was here. I mean, at least they, you know, it was a reunion for everybody, which is kind well, of cool. I'll tell you what it was. With Tom and I are one of the few photographers that can say that we shot both festivals 50 years apart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And no, that's um, an honor. Yeah, that's an honor. The, uh, the yeah. 50th anniversary was nowhere near no. uh, the first one, no. and um, we had we had a few issues, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think though that the original, just the intent, because Lou Adler was involved as well. D. A. Pennybacker was there. Uh, his son was actually uh, filming everything, so that was kind of cool. Uh, yeah. His boys, and I got this group shot of all of them. That, that was pretty cool. But the um, I think the again the intent was just in Lou's eyes was to honor the the fifty year spread. Yeah, that's he right. knew right away that there wouldn't be any more. No, it, it was a nice honor for you guys. Yeah, to, and, you know, and see with you know, Lou involved, he acknowledged. You, know, you yeah. guys are acknowledged. The photographers right. were being acknowledged, and and, and, and the thing is right that there. with Lou involved, they could legally call it. The International Monterey Pop Festival, because Lou actually owns the name, since oh, yeah. it is, it yeah. is a, a nonprofit. Okay, so now that when he, came, you were there at that meeting when the, the city managers yeah. and everybody were at a meeting, and Lou said, "Okay, today I officially become part of this. So now yeah. we can move forward, and we are in fact the International Monterey Pop Festival." Yeah, and. Uh that was a kind of a cool thing they did in the reunion where each band had to play one of the songs from the, yeah. uh, you know, from uh, like uh, uh, California Dreamin' or whatever, everybody played, had to play one, which was a nice tribute to the musicians. Yeah. Uh, that uh, played. It was, um, yeah, when Michelle Phillips came out and sang California Dreamin' with this group called uh, The Head and the Heart, uh, they had actually had a chance to rehearse it about an hour before, and I, I was part of that. I got to you know, Lou brought me in so I could get some candid shots of that. So that was a moment of still of history. And then she went out and just killed it. It, it was wonderful. And then I I got this. I was sitting when she performed. I was sitting right behind Lou in his uh, in his box seat. He had the best view of the house. And, and Michelle came up and sat next to him and put her head right on his shoulder. And I got this shot with the stage in the background and all. I was pretty, it was, it was very cool. But um, uh, there was another woman, Nikki Blum. I, I was telling you yesterday. Yeah. Um, and Nikki Blum sang, um, uh, I think, White Rabbit. One of the songs, the yeah. incredible song uh, that Grace Slick sings. And Nikki just nailed it. And that was very, very significant. I thought, I like yeah. that. Maybe they could have done more. To bring some of the groups back, uh, uh, they brought the them back pieces. Or uh, the animals back, right? You know, Nicky Blum. Yeah, the animals, they came was, back. And he was it's different. A nice show. And Flesh was there you know, from the dead. He had his own band. He closed it, I think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that, that it just, you know, some of it didn't didn't work. Yeah. But, um, Anyway, uh, it, it was, I, I enjoyed it. There's a guy, Father John Misty. He, 
you know, much more contemporary, but he put on, you know, a great show. And of course they had some of the best sound equipment going, but yeah. there was no food like they had before. No, and, and everything on the and, cell and everything. And yeah. And, and people, you know, were just, it was open seating on the ground. You know, you had to bring your own blanket. I mean, there were yeah, so, so um, different. And, um, you know, but yeah, what, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say though that it's just it's a no-win situation because today with the way the bands demand so much, uh, you need huge numbers for ticket sales, and the fairgrounds only holds fourteen thousand people. Yeah, yeah, that's and it. And so Lou was very aware of the fact that you know this was a one-time shot, and one I don't know shot, made, yeah. any, made any money. I don't know what the deals were to, to work out with the bands, but there, you know, some people said, why didn't they have any more? Well, Lou and John, you know, had it in the works. Yeah. Uh, in 1968, they were they were building up in the spring there for a Monterey Pop too. But they went through so much. Monterey Pop too. They they already had people booked, but but uh, Minnie Coyle and her her band of crazy people uh, literally, you know, fought them uh, and did not want. The disruption, even though the first one had been done okay, but the, the subculture had already grown so much more, and there was a lot of negative stuff going on, and they just didn't want this to happen in Monterey. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but was she not a Republican? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but she... I remember those very contentious city council meetings where uh, she was just going uh, nose to nose and. Uh, my mother at the time owned a Bavarian delicatessen in Monterey. And uh, she said, I have had so much business on that entire weekend and everybody was so well behaved yeah. and, and so nice. And I heard this from a lot of merchants in Monterey. They thought that they were going to be overrun with people shoplifting. They said, everybody that came into the store was so nice and so mellow. And, you know, uh, but Minnie Coyle wouldn't have any of it. Uh, yeah. she, and, and she, 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 she told Lou Adler and John Phillips, she wanted them to, to, for the two guys to sign this affidavit with all these these um, protocols and these things that were not would wouldn't be allowed. No drinking. Yeah. No smoking of marijuana. No wow. having sex anywhere publicly. Yeah. On, on the property. You know, all these things would be in violation. And, and and he Lou basically said, and I am quoting him, he said, it was like the Inquisition. Yeah. Like the Spanish Inquisition. And, he, they got they it in the and, and they just they threw up there and said, We're out of here. And so thanks to Minnie Coyle, there wasn't a second one. And imagine the history that would have been. And imagine maybe able to work this out for a few years. Think of yeah. what the would have done to the tax base for for Monterey. Think about oh, yeah. it for for people like Fred's mom. You know, look what look what the jazz festival brings in. You yeah, know, exactly. and, uh, you know, you're so right, Tom. Uh, and it's just sometimes you 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 just need to give people a little bit of slack. Yeah. You know, because that could have been uh, a remarkable thing. Now Woodstock was the one that they always talk about and Woodstock was pretty much a freaking mess. Whereas yeah. Monterey was uh, very intimate. I, I hate to use the word, but cozy, yeah. you know, uh, everybody was walking around the vibes uh, between the cops, the uh, rock stars, the vendors, the audience, uh, everybody. And I was talking to, um, you know, people that uh, work up and down Fremont Boulevard, right by the fairgrounds, all the motels, they said nobody trashed any rooms, you know, and uh, Minnie Coyle literally slammed the door. And the dark surprise even millions got- Millions in, in profits for the entire peninsula. Yeah. Not just Monterey, but Carmel, Pacific Grove, Del yeah. Rio. I, I got another point. Um, this is again from Lou that I just I love. This says yeah. it all. He said Monterey was about the music. Woodstock was about the weather. And Altamont was about the violence. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So those are three iconic 
you know, uh, rock festivals, uh, but they're all known for something different. And, mm -hmm. and Altamont essentially that that killed the peace love dove, the the yeah. whole flower. Oh, yeah. It really did, yeah. And and oddly enough, it was. The, <laughs> Minnie Coyle had this fear of the Hell's Angels. Yeah, it was Sonny Barger and the Hell's Angels, and oh, then like, like, getting murdered right by the stage. And and uh, to see Mick Jagger, you know, not have any control over the audience, that was about as chaotic and a, and as much of a tragedy to the beautiful movement of the music that yeah, and, and Mick uh, Mick just uh, lost control uh, of the uh, and you're right Tom you lose control of your audience you're done yeah you're you done back it up because you are done yeah and uh, that just got too far out and the only reason I didn't go to Woodstock is because I couldn't find a flight out to the East Coast yeah. And by the time Altamont rolled around, I, I got involved with something else. But friends of mine that went said, uh, it's a good thing you didn't go because you you would not have enjoyed it. Yeah. Now, uh, let's say uh, one of the, the listeners here, I know they're going to be calling me and and posting stuff. What if they say, I want to get one uh, a photo from Tom or, or Fred? Can you have okay, a website? What you do is just have them uh, uh personal message us because all of our photos, all of our books, everything's for sale. Okay. And either get to Tom uh, uh, on this personal message, say, Tom, I'm interested in this and that, or go to my website. Tom, okay. what, what's your website? My, yeah, it's very easy to do it through the website. It's um, T-G-O, my initials, T-G-O photo.com. TGOphoto.com. And mine is vintagerockphotography.com. Okay. What's, what's even easier, if you just go to Google and just type in my name, I got nothing right. behind you. So okay. You now on the bottom of your screen, type in my name or type in Tom's name and uh, it'll bring it up. I mean, all the, and if, if somebody forgets, whatever. Message me, call me. I'll give you uh, uh, the information on how to get a hold of Tom and Fred. And uh, Tom and Fred, uh, like I said, I'm really enjoying this, and I could we could go on forever. And I know we got to stop, but anyway, this has been a fascinating. I mean, absolutely fascinating to hear you guys talk. And uh, I'm going to take you up on what Fred said that we're going to get together another time. That's great. We just barely scratched the surface. Wait, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, have another seven, eight, like another day, seven, eight, nine day. questions, you know, but we'll save those for later. Yeah. And uh, yeah, really, yeah. And if any, any of you people out there, if you got any questions, uh, just uh, get, type them out to Johnny. And the next time that we're on, yeah. We'll go through them one by one, and uh, we'll right. answer them all. We will get together again, and that's for sure. And uh, I love you guys. Thank you so yeah. much. You guys take yeah. care. Happy New Year. Okay. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Bye. See you, Jay. Okay, Monterey Pop Festival. That was fantastic. Wow. That was unbelievable. Uh, everything, everything about it, how it started, oh, Hendrix, Joplin, everything. But anyway, I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to uh, thank everybody for coming on today to watch this uh, beautiful show. And uh, I want, if if somebody missed it, have them watch it. Go on uh, Buzzing with Cousin and scroll down and uh, watch the replay. You could also, in a couple days, go on uh, Buzzing with Cousin on uh, YouTube. Scroll down and you could find this show and also other past shows and subscribe to the channel. And uh, so I'm going to be on again in. Uh, next uh, Tuesday, and uh, it's going to be, uh, we've got, uh, our guest is going to be next Tuesday at 1 o'clock, uh, December, uh, or I mean January 
12, Brandy Hannon. Brandy is a retired uh, skater, and uh, she's a coach of the Dread Ponies, which is a junior roller derby team called the Dread Ponies. And uh, Brandy went, skated by the name of White Trash Brand, uh, White Trash Barbie. So uh, we're going to be talking roller derby. So we'll see you in a week. And uh, Happy New Year. And everybody have a great night. And uh, from words of uh, Eric Burden and the Animals in the song Monterey, I think I'm dreaming. Bye.